today we will be looking at Romans chapter 8, uh, verses 26 through 27. Uh, this is part 10, as you see, of our uh, series through the, the uh, eighth chapter of Romans. Today we're going to be talking about being led by the Spirit. Prayer is an important part of the Christian life. But what you must understand, and so many people get this wrong, prayer does not change God's mind. It doesn't change God's will. What prayer does is prayer brings us into a relationship, an intimate relationship with God that brings us more into the will of God so that we are willing to accept what God may be doing in our lives at that time and to be able and empowered to live a Christian life. Some people believe that God is like a a vending machine, you pop in a couple of coins and God pops out and gives you what you want, you're satisfied and he's gone. You just put it back up, you throw it in the trash can. That is not the way prayer is supposed to be. Prayer is supposed to be a vehicle in which I draw close to God in my weakness and in my need for a Savior and for an empower and an encourager. The Holy Spirit we're going to find out in our passage today, is our advocate in prayer. And we're going to see his, that's one of those uh, experiential ministry of the Holy Spirit as he works in you and you can actively feel this going on. Uh, how is your prayer life today? You ever prayed and you felt like your prayer was with as far as your voice carried? Mm -hmm. You ever prayed and you felt like you got right in touch with God? You had his full attention. See, our, our condition in life, whether we're humble and submitted, whether we're uh, committing sin and not repentant of that sin, affects greatly our prayer life. You see, God hears every prayer. God answers every prayer. Now, what you need to realize is there are four different ways in which God answers prayer. The first one is direct. Time you pray for something, God may respond that quick. A lot of times, it's by delay. God delays your answer, and you keep praying for it. Thirdly, it's different. I may not be praying for God's will to be done. I may be selfish. And God may answer my prayer differently than, than I wanted to, but according to His will. And then fourthly, it's denial. That's right. God will tell you flat out no sometimes. Because we don't know how we should pray. We don't know what we should pray for. We're going to see that in our text today. And we need to accept that as part of God's absolute sovereignty over his creation. The Bible says in 1 John, uh, yeah, 1 John 5, 13, that we, when we pray according to God's will, that we know that we have our petitions before God. So we pray in confidence, we pray in faith, and then by faith, we accept what God is going to do in and through prayer. You with me so far? You mad at me? <laughs> oh, if you'll stand, Romans chapter 8, and we'll read verses 26 and 27. We need to honor God's Word in our church and in our society. Romans chapter 8, verse 26. Likewise, the Spirit also helps in our weaknesses, for we do not know what we should pray for as we ought. But the Spirit Himself makes intercession for us with, with, with groanings which cannot be uttered. Now he who searches the heart knows the mind of the Spirit because he makes intercession for the saints according to the will of God. Amen. Brother Bart Farmer, would you pray for us this morning? Gracious God, thank you so much. Thank you for your
text this morning. Um, intercession is one ministry of the Holy Spirit and experiential ministry. There are not experiential ministries that you don't fully realize or feel or, or have uh, or really can tell what's going on. But then you have experiential ministries when you actually experience the Spirit moving in your heart and, and in your life. And today we're going to talk about that. Intercessory prayer is when you are praying for someone else or on behalf of someone else. It's not when you're praying for yourself and your wish list. Okay? It's when you are praying for someone else. So, let's notice what happens here. Look at the groaning of the Spirit in verse 26. The word, uh, look at the person who is praying. The Spirit, third person of the triunity of God. If you go to John chapter 14, 15, and 16, you'll see where the Holy Spirit laid out the greatest amount of information that you can find on the Spirit of God in the Bible. And it gives us the ministry of the Holy Spirit. Jesus said, it is expedient that I go away, for if I do not go away, I will not send the Spirit. But it is good for you or beneficial to you if I go and I will send the Spirit. The Spirit is the person of God who is energizing and, and encouraging and working in your life today as a true believer in Jesus Christ. Uh, if we would go through the whole pattern, uh, the moment uh, God called you, the Holy Spirit gave you faith to believe, the Holy Spirit uh, baptized you into the family of God, He indwelled you, He sealed you for the day of redemption, and now He is living within you, and living within you he is not some idle uh, participant in your life, He is an active participant in your life, praying and interceding and encouraging and edifying you every single day as you grow closer and closer to God. Uh, so that's who the Holy Spirit is basically in a, in a nutshell. Look at the power that he has. The word helps there. It says, uh, likewise, in the same manner, the Spirit also helps in our weaknesses. He helps. Present middle tense verb, which meaning that it is the Holy Spirit who is helping you. And he's not, see, the Holy Spirit doesn't help you in those occasions when you're down or disappointed or having a bad day. The Holy Spirit continually ministers to you every single day, every, every night when you lay in bed. You can talk to God, and the Spirit of God can be ministering to you. The word literally means to assist someone. And then it means to take hold of with someone and share the task. The way to really understand this passage is to look at Luke chapter 10, uh, I think it's verse 40, where uh, Jesus has went to Mary and Martha's house, right? Martha is doing what was traditionally and socially acceptable. She was trying to fix a meal for Jesus. She had a guest in her house. It was her responsibility to make sure that guest was looked after. Mary chose to sit at Jesus' feet and hear him speak and hear him teach, which the Bible tells us was the better thing to do. But that did not relieve her of her responsibility to help prepare for the guests, right? And so evidently, uh, Martha gets a little bit irritated, and she said, Lord, tell Mary to help me. She didn't say to tell Mary to come and fix the meal. What she was saying was, tell Mary to lend me a hand. It is a beautiful picture of the Holy Spirit coming alongside of us as a paraclete or paracletos. He comes along beside of us and he doesn't take your burden away. But what he does is he takes hold of that burden with you and lifts it up off of you so that you can bear and endure the trial that you're going through. He doesn't take it away completely. Wouldn't that be nice? That when I had a bad day, I could just say, Holy Spirit, have a bad day. Take it! And it'd be gone. Well, that'd be great. Doesn't work like that. But what he does is he gives you the power and assists you that you can bear and get through it. And isn't that what, uh, what we want to do in our prayer life, as we're going to find out? We need power. We need help. On our own, we are a target for Satan. A very easy target. And Satan is a roaring lion seeking whom he may devour. Amen. 
So we need help. We need power. So we have a person. We have the Holy Spirit of God who lives within us. We have his power. That is a divine power that is capable and able to overcome anything in your life. There is no problem too great for God. There is no sin he cannot forgive and will not forgive. Third, look at the problem we have. Weakness. It denotes the condition of, 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 of man in this age. Both physical and spiritual sufferings and trials and distress. When you're having a day that you think, don't think you can bear it, you can't. But God can. And God takes a hold of it with you so you can get through it. And then when you get through that day, then you should give God the praise for what He's done in your life getting you through that. So many times... We're back to the vending machine again. So many times we want God's help, but the time God helps, we want to put Him away. Amen. And God wants humble, obedient people to serve Him. Amen. But we have weaknesses. We do not have the power to come to God as we ought to. Notice the next part of this verse. Again, the brother of the Spirit. Look at the per perplexity that we have. It says, we know. It says, Likewise, the Spirit also helps our, our, our weaknesses, our infirmities. For we do not know, absolutely do not know, to perceive or apprehend. I, don't, I cannot apprehend everything I need to know when I come to God. What we should pray for as we ought. The word what means the content or manner of, or, of, of proper prayer. Now, as Matthew Henry said, we know the, the basics of prayer. Lord, forgive me. Lord, save me. Lord help me, right? Basic concepts. We all know that. But when it comes to a particular situation, we do not know what we ought, what is necessary in the nature of the case to pray for. We, first of all, we don't know fully God's will. We don't know fully God's intention of what He's doing through a certain situation. I may pray, Lord, uh, heal person A and God may be using his illness to discipline and train him. So God's not going to take you away just because I prayed and asked it. God's will is going to be accomplished. Because I don't know God's intent for why a person may be sick or why a person loses a job or why a person goes through a bad time. I don't know that. God does. And see, that's why I don't know how I should pray in, that way, in, in cases because I don't know the whole case. I don't know the background. All I see is the presenting problem that I see this person's having a bad day. And through the love of God and compassion of God, then I want to pray for that person, but I might not know how to pray or exactly the particular of the prayer that I should pray at that time in order to get God to do something in that person's life. Amen. So you might say, well, why should I pray? If I don't know everything, if I don't know what's right, and I don't know what God's doing, why should I even bother to pray? Why? Because it's the Holy Spirit. Look at that part of that verse. But the Spirit Himself. Notice it, 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 it says that twice in a row. The Spirit Himself. That's for emphasis. So you know that it is not you who are doing the praying, but the Holy Spirit of God who indwells you, who is doing the praying and directing you in how you should pray. Are you with me? Amen. <laughs> For the Spirit Himself, the Spirit intercedes to plead the case of another. Uh, we're going to look at this word a little deeper when we get to verse 27. But right now, it simply means, means that I have the privilege as a believer to intercede to go to God and to plead your case on behalf of you. That's a great privilege. And that's something that we need to do every week. Uh, you need to pray for me. I need to pray for you. Here's something better. We need to pray for each other. We all have bad days. We all get caught up in the rumor mill, in the gossip mill, and passing things around. We need to pray for one another. Amen. Pray for one another. We're supposed to love one another and lift one another up and encourage one another. And see, I don't know the particulars about everybody's case, but God does. 
And God wants me to intercede. But when I can't do that, notice says The Holy Spirit's praying. With groanings, it says, The Spirit maketh intercession, please for us, our case, in front of God, for us with groanings which cannot be uttered. The word uh, groanings, as we talked about two weeks ago, means sigh. It is a deep internal desire. Don't you want to see somebody who's having a bad day have a better day? Don't you want to see somebody who's sick get well? Don't you want to see somebody who is <clears throat> sorrowing and grieving and, and just broken hearted have a better, brighter day? Of course you do. That's what loving each other is all about. That's what being a Christian is all about. It's loving and caring and fellowship and family with, with one another and lifting each other up. But, but the, we, we can't do that because we don't know everything. So the Holy Spirit who lives within me, you ever been so grieved and, and so stressed about praying for something that you really got to put it into words? I mean, you, you, were, you were perplexed. You, you were... You just didn't know what to say to God. You know, I've already said everything I can. God help, God, your will be done. Amen. And sometimes you, you feel that's just not enough. I just, I just haven't done enough. I haven't said enough. And so the Holy Spirit takes the intent of your heart. And he says he utters it. This describes groanings which are not capable. Listen to me. Not capable of accurately being, uh, of being adequate, adequately expressed in words. Okay, I'm going to make some of you mad, I guess. This is not a prayer language. You make a mistake if you identify this with Glossia. This is not the <coughs> gift that we find in Romans 12 of speaking in an unknown language. Because the unknown language is a gift that's given to certain individuals, not to every believer, if there is such a thing. It's not given to everybody. So everybody does not have a prayer language. Remember a few years ago that we went through the Southern Baptist Hot Wildfire? Preachers and doctors and other such things were saying, oh, I have developed a prayer life, a prayer language to God. Well, if you pray, you let the Holy Spirit pray, you got a prayer language. Amen. You don't need to speak in some babble and some gibberish that nobody can understand. And notice, notice now, this cannot be expressed in words, so it's not audible. It's the Holy Spirit communicating with God with the intentions of your heart that is a communication of divinity but between one person of the Godhead and another person of the Godhead. That's how much God loves you. That's how intent God is on hearing your prayers. Amen. So should you pray? Amen. Of course you should pray. You should pray believing that God heard that prayer and have the faith that God is going to do what is right and then accept in the outcome. Amen. Too many times people pray for something and it doesn't happen and they get mad. And then they're mad to God. <laughs> I start to say something, I'll move on. <laughs> I will say it too. God doesn't know you a thing. Okay? God doesn't know you a thing. I love you. I love every one of you. But God don't know you anything. He's given you the privilege to talk to Him. And we need to exercise that privilege. No matter how you feel about prayer, you need to exercise your privilege to come to God. Because that is one of the most intimate ways that we can have, have communication and relationship with God. Is to talk to Him. So, we see the groaning of the Spirit. Have you noticed in this passage that the creation groaned? We, believers, groan to be delivered. And now the Holy Spirit is groaning on your behalf to God to make sure that the intentions of your heart are delivered to God in a way that is, that is understandable and acceptable to God and to God's perfect will. That's good stuff. It's deep theology, but it's good stuff. Look at the glory of the sovereign. And the reason I, I, I said it like this is the very first phrase in, in, in this verse. It says, Now he who searches the hearts knows the mind of the Spirit. Man. The person is God Himself. Only God knows the heart. If you were to go back all the way to 1 Samuel, 
chapter 16 and verse 7. It says, But the Lord said to Samuel, Do not look at his appearance or at his physical statue, because I have refused him. Isn't that great? That ought to make everybody in here feel good. Amen. First of all, he said, Don't look at, at his appearance. You can be ugly, you can be good looking. Doesn't matter to God. It said, Or his physical statue. You can be a whip or you can be a giant. God doesn't care. For the Lord does not see as man sees. Can I get a hallelujah? Amen. Amen. For man looks at the outward appearance. Don't we do that? Don't we judge the book by the cover before we ever get to know them? It says, and, and, and the outward appearance, but the Lord looks at the heart. You go over to Jeremiah uh, chapter 7, verse 10. It says, I, the Lord, search the heart. I test the mind. And even to every even to give every man according to his ways, according to the fruit of his doings. God knows every single thing that you have on your heart and your mind. God knows it. That's why I say when you pray to God, you might as well be honest. He knows already. He searches. To search into, to examine, to investigate. I don't know about you, but I'm glad that God does that. I'm glad that God knows my intentions because my intentions and my actions aren't always the same. They don't always correspond. But I'm glad that God knows that He knows that I, that I love Him, that I'm trying. I fail, but I'm trying. I fail, but I'm trying. I fail, but I'm trying. Because God knows that. That's the person. But look at His perception. He said He, he knows perfect, active, he perfect. He knows completely. And he's actively doing it continually. God knows every thought you have, every intention of your heart. Isn't there a verse in Hebrews 4 16 that says, The word of God divides, even unto the sun, or to divide the demon and the barracks, it says discern that the thoughts and intents of the heart. Amen. That confirms what this just said. Amen. God knows everything about you. He knows that you want to have compassion on that person. He knows that you love that person, that you want to relieve their, their, their stress and their tension. And he knows that you are doing that because you love that individual. Aren't you glad that's, that God knows all that? Amen. Amen. You don't have secrets with God. You can get home, shut your door, and do things behind your door that your neighbors do not know. You can't do that with God. So, therefore... You might as well be honest with God. And when you come to God in prayer, you might as well, if you fail today, you need to say, God, I did it. The devil didn't make me do it. I did it. I messed up. And because I messed up, I'm coming with my hat in my hand, begging and pleading for your mercy and your grace. Because God knows the intents of your heart. But then, he, he knows the mind of the spirit, the mind of the frame of thought. It refers to the result of one's thinking, you ever have a thought and you wonder where it came from? You have a bad thought and you go, wow, I didn't want to, I didn't, I didn't want to do that. I didn't mean that. But see, he knows the mind of the spirit. That shows you the absolute unison and, and intimacy within the Godhead. God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. God the Father is the one who hears the prayer. God the Holy Spirit intercedes for you in dwelling in you. And God the Son at the right hand of God is interceding for you as a high priest. Look at Romans 34. Or Romans 8, 34. It says, Who is he who condemns? It is Christ who died and furthermore is also risen, who is even at the right hand of God, who makes what? Intercession. Intercession. Pleads my case before God. He knows me. I'm glad God knows everything about us, folks. If nothing else, okay, if nothing else, I'll, I'll be on my pity gospel side here. If nothing else, that I'll keep you in line. <laughs> that verse done. Yep. I, I was reading through Hebrews this week, chapter 12. God disciplines his children. Yep. Amen. He does it. Why? Because he knows my heart. Thirdly, look at his purpose. 
He makes intercession. The word literally means to follow in with or to lie upon, to meet and talk with, to plead the case of one against another as in a judicial system, as a courtroom. If you wanted to use our, our vernacular today, you could say that the Holy Spirit acts as my defense attorney before the judgment seat of God. Satan is the prosecuting attorney who's accusing me every single day that he's right in accusing me because I do sin and I do fail. But I've got a, a, a defense attorney over here who is Almighty God himself in the flesh, the Lord Jesus, and he says, yep, he made a mistake, but it's covered. What? The prosecutor says, no, he's guilty, he sinned. The defense attorney says, yeah, you're right, he did sin, but it's paid for. It's covered by the blood of Jesus. See, it's not wrong to make a mistake. It's wrong to stay in that mistake. Amen. See what I'm saying? First, first sermon Jesus ever preached. What, what was it on? Repentance. John the Baptist. First sermon he ever preached. What was it on? Repentance. Turning back to God and admitting that I made a mistake. It's not a death penalty. It can be. But God forgives. Everybody should have said amen. amen. Are we asleep this morning? God forgives, right? Amen, amen because he forgave you. Amen. And because he forgave you, he'll forgive anybody. And because he does that, then he is, the Holy Spirit is interceding on my behalf when I'm so grieved and so down and disappointed and discouraged that I can't really put into words what I want God to know. The Holy Spirit knows my heart. God knows the Holy Spirit's heart. And therefore, God knows every single thing about me completely. Moving on. Look at the people that he's doing this for. Saints. Members of the Christian community. Those who have been set apart and sanctified by God. Are you a saint? If you're truly saved and you made a genuine confession of faith in God as your Savior, you are a saint of God. You may not act like it. You may not look like it. But that does not change your position before the judgment seat of God. You are a saint of God. Boy, the next, the next section of this, 28, 29, and 30, I don't know if we're going to be able to do a verse a week. I don't know if we're going to be able to do them all at one time. It is packed. With, with theological significance. And we're going to take time to look at it. Amen. Theology is not boring. Amen. Hopefully, it will help you to grow. Our Sunday school class has turned into a 101 Bible college class. <laughs> we're learning details, facts and figures about the attributes of God. Mark's doing a good job. Give you a little plug. Bro. But we need to learn, folks, Superficial Christianity will not survive the 21st century. Amen. Hear me, folks. Amen. Playing church ain't going to get it. You've got to commit to God. And, God. and when you commit to God, see God's there for you. You don't have to do this by yourself. Because you can. We're saints of God. Why? Because He said we were. And look at the plan. According, concerning, and applying the manner and, and, and conformity to uh, God. In the, in the original text, if you'll notice in your Bible, it's probably in, uh, in italics, the word will, the will of God. It's actually according to God. Elohim, to those of God, the triunity. What is that? What is so important about that? We talked this morning about God's justice. He's just, right? God is the ultimate standard for right. No man-made law, no constitution, no agreement, no contract between men will ever be according to the perfect standard of God. And we are supposed to be being conformed to that standard. That's why we can be called righteous people when we conform to the standard of God. The Bible says we fall short of that standard. And because we do fall short of that standard, because we're human, we've got a sinful nature that lives in here. And because we fall short, 
the Holy Spirit is interceding in prayer for us so that God understands our feelings and our emotions. He already does. And he does that according to God. And God's standard is what he's talking about there. See, I need to come to God on God's terms, folks. Amen. Not David's terms. Not Southern Baptist or Pentecostal or whatever it may be. But on God's terms. And God's terms simply says, you have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. And because of that, then God's willing to forgive. And God forgives. If you ask for it, if you seek it, God will forgive you. There's no greater emotional feeling in this world than to know that you are right with God. I want to say something to you. Coming to church, don't let you say Giving money doesn't make you say It is the intimate, personal relationship with Almighty God through Jesus Christ that makes us able to be adopted as God's children and then adapted to his conformity. Are you willing to do that today? Would you say, God, I need your forgiveness. I need your help. That's all it takes. Be genuine and believe in your heart. And God. Thank you. 